downstairs to the gathering space and put it on the white table at the back of the room, that would be incredibly helpful for picking it up to go to Grace, okay? If you're not able, don't worry about it. It's okay. Yes? When are you taking it home to Grace? Tuesday morning. Okay, so I've got to sell it all Okay, okay. Yeah, can you just come on by and drop it on that white table too? And I believe that we will be here tomorrow for Kershaw ministry. So the doors will be open tomorrow night if anybody needs to get in, starting at 6.30. Okay? So um, that would be great, 6.30 to about 7.30 or so, and then how many of us are here, where we are in our projects, you know, and all the deal like that. And all the stuff we have to share with ourselves. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's an option, but then we're not going to bring it up here because we're going to put it in the car after that. Okay, um, so it'll we'll move in two stages <laughs> if that's okay. And we want to thank Sandy for um, being the one who's spearheading getting it from here to there because that is a project. Thank you, Sandy. All right, now. Bonnie, I didn't get a chance to ask you this. Do you have a reader staff for today? Sure. Do you have a reader? No. Okay, then Jean's going to read and I will do the prayers. All right. Um, also, Wednesday night is the church council meeting. It will begin at 7 p.m. We will meet either via Zoom or here in person for those people who prefer that. Um, and no, I didn't send a link yet because they get buried in everybody's um, email, but I will send it this afternoon. Okay? Um, I also want to remind people that if you have anything for the newsletter, please, please, please get it to Mary by 8 a.m. on Monday. That does not mean she's always here at 8 a.m. on Monday, but that way she's surely got it when she does get it. Okay, so that means Sunday afternoon writing for some of us. All right, um, are there other announcements for the good of the congregation? Okay, awesome, thanks. <clears throat>
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Amen. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love as this world, to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness. We confess that sins still have a hold on us. We have harmed a good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Friend. Amen. The love of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. God among us, we gather in the name of your Son to learn love from one another. Keep our feet from evil paths. Turn our minds to your wisdom and our hearts to the grace revealed in your, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We hear God's promises written in God's Word. first reading comes from the book of the prophet Malachi. See the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sound of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Word of God. Word of God. Thank you. Thank you. The second reading comes from the book, second book of Thessalonians. <clears throat> now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. And we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have the right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness mere busybodies not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Word of God, Lord of life. Thanks be to God. Song for the word is Yezu, Yezu, Seven zero eight verses one and two.
Luke, the 21st chapter. And some are speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God. Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not, not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? He said, Beware that you will not be led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will fo not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents by <clears throat> will withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By endurance, you will gain your souls. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, Jesus, for this word. Well, whether we know it or not, today is a special day. What makes it rather special is it's not really a special day. It's a special day in the sense that it's the end of Pentecost. But it's not a special day because it's not really a holiday or anything. We end of Pentecost, but we don't really celebrate the end of Pentecost. We have a festival next week. We have Christ the King Sunday, and uh, that's a special day. But we end Pentecost today. Today is the last season of Pentecost. It's the last teaching of Christ. This takes place just as Christ leaves the temple before he's arrested, uh, before, the, before the Last Supper. This is one of his last teachings. Um, so it's what it makes this Sunday significant. Why do we have such a difficult text? Now, I like to teach and to preach on the church year. The church year itself kind of brings us the gospel. It is set to convey the experience of the whole Christ event as we move through the church year. It's set up to convey the experience, it's set up to give a glimpse of what it means to be in this whole gospel story. It's to be the disciple experiencing the historical encounter of Jesus. To think about what it means to be a disciple. Right? They, they, they encounter Jesus when they're very young. They're just, they live their short lives as young Jews awaiting the Messiah, which is Advent. Then they live their short, then they are called out by Jesus. They get to walk. They get to talk, they get to eat, they get to spend their lives with Jesus. They get to be taught by the Son of God. And they truly are unique, the disciples, in the history of humanity. They get to experience the physical and the historical Jesus. Now, does this make them special? Yeah. And no. I mean, we do experience the physicality of Jesus if we really believe in our sacraments and real presence of Christ. They see and touch and hear Jesus. We too get to touch Jesus in our sacraments. But also, they get to experience a despair that we never really truly get. 
So they experienced the death of Jesus in a way that we can't. We're post-resurrection Christians. We do know the end of the story. But when Jesus hits the cross and dies on that cross, there was no resurrection. They knew a despair before God created the resurrection that we will never know as we know the end of the story. And then they lived for several decades, forging out what these events mean, suffering for the sake of the gospel in ways that only a special few really know. And in the West, we don't know that. This was the life of the disciples. This is the life that Jesus warns of today. Before we get back, I want to get back to that church here. People wonder why Pentecost is so long. And I mentioned throughout that it's meant to teach us what it means to be a disciple, to capture that experience of the original disciples. And Advent is to know the Jewish experience of longing for a coming, a coming Messiah, to live the short life of the disciples before Jesus calls them. Then in several months, right, we get special seasons, special events. We have Epiphany, we have Lent, we have Easter, we have the baptism of our Lord, we have the Transfiguration, we have Holy Week, right? We experience this whirlwind of events with Jesus. And then several months of Pentecost, like the original disciples, we try to remember what Jesus taught us. We have all this time to sit and remember the individual teachings of Jesus. And how does that apply to our lives? And how do we think about forming our lives around all these teachings that Jesus brought to us, how his teaching can affect the several death pains of the lives that we have left to live. And it all ends today with this gospel. Not a time you exactly want to bring visitors to our, to our church. It's not, in contemporary terms, this is a marketing nightmare. This is not a fun gospel. But it's appropriate for the last Sunday. You see, Luke records people calling Jesus teacher 11 times. This is his last teaching. So what is Jesus teaching with these best and difficult, worst and frightening words? Again, he's teaching what it means to be a follower of Christ. Hopefully we got all of his other teachings, all of the wonderful beautiful things about being a follower of Jesus, because this is what it all boils down to. First, you have to understand the meaning of the temple, right? The disciples probably have never seen the temple before. It's a, it's a, grueling, it's a grueling journey to get there. It's a half an hour, 45 minutes by car to go from Galilee to Jerusalem. And it's a treacherous event. It's, it's just a barren wasteland of desert rocks and hard terrain and you march for miles half an hour that's by car walking it takes days and you walk through this terrible terrible terrain until finally you see this glimmer in the sky the temple is built out of gold and marble so that the sun just gleams and out of nothing comes this glimmer of light and that's your first exposure to the temple for these, these, these farmers and fishermen from the Galilee. In the middle of nothing, there's this brightness, the glory of the temple. It was like nothing they could ever conceive. For a Jewish person, this was proof that God was with them. As the glory unfolds and you get closer, and closer and this grand beauty, this awesome nature of the temple was proof that God was with them. I mean, how could this wide assortment of tribes, 12 tribes that never had autonomy for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were constantly being overrun by, by, by different uh, empires back and forth. They're called, the area is called the Levant, meaning there's a passageway Egypt used it to get to, to Rome and Greece, and Greece and Rome used it to get to, to Egypt. And they constantly oppressed Israel, 
And yet they were able to build this monumental temple of glory and beauty and awesomeness. How else could this lowly group of tribes build such a glorious building unless there was truly a God who loved them, cared for them, and protected them? And then Jesus equates himself with the temple. Jesus then uh, <clears throat> does not destroy the temple. He condemns the misuse of the temple. He, did, he uses it as a metaphor. And he metaphorically talks about tearing it down and rebuilding it. But he doesn't condemn that success of the beauty and the building of the temple that God blesses the Jewish people with. But Jesus warns us not to put our faith in the blessings that God gives us. God blesses us with success and good things all of our lives, all the time. But make no mistake, those come from God. But bad things, they do not come from a lack of God. We cannot restore good things by more faith in God. It's not if our nation is more Christian and becomes stronger. That's a lie. It's not you will prosper if you believe more in God. That's a lie. Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is not fully yet among us. We learn that we can see it appear, but it's still a broken world. Jesus did not destroy the temple. We did. Jesus did not allow his son to die. He killed him. God gave us the most glorious thing in the world, his son, so that our sin, even the sin of destroying both of those temples, would not keep us from the love that God has for us. So we do not put our faith, we do not believe in God because of the blessings we receive. In this broken world, they could all disappear. Then we'd have no strength to get through the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. We'd have no strength to get through the destruction of the temple that is God's Son. But if we have faith in God's love, if we believe in God, if we believe that God loves us, if we believe that God cares about us, that He loves us and knows every hair on our head, some of us that's a larger of faith and some of them. But anyway, that if we believe in every hair on our head, then we can wade through some of the even greatest chaos and despair that God, that, that this world could put in front of us. And no matter what this broken world has for us, the kingdom that God has in store for us can be real to us because of the love that God has for us. It's the strength of the faith and the love of God that keeps us going. It's the faith, the strength of the faith and the love that God has for us that gives us the strength to go every day no matter what the broken world has in store for us. For the original disciples, it meant this world meant the despair of Jesus' death, wading through that despair until God brought the resurrection. It meant the chaos of the temple's destruction. It meant the chaos of their own destruction. For just preaching the gospel. For us, it could mean the chaos of losing the blessings that God has given to us. It could mean the despair of facing death that surrounds us. But if we truly believe that God can love us so much as to know every hair on our head, then no matter what destruction, chaos, despair the broken world has, we can walk through the discussion with the power of God's love. We can walk through chaos with the peace of God's love. We can walk through despair with the hope of God's love. Jesus picks as his last lesson at Pentecost. Before we have to go alone with, as the disciples did. Before we begin the Christ event all over again in the church. 
And if you truly believe God loves you enough to know every hair on your head, even the most profound sense of death that we may glimpse for now, but will soon live forever through the resurrection that God has us. Healing God, 
Your people cry out to you. Sustain doctors, nurses, and hospital personnel in their tireless work. Uphold mental health professionals and those in their care. May the sun of righteousness rise on all who are sick, especially those we name now in our minds or in our hearts. Glory in your mercy. Yeah. Uniting God, unite this assembly in its shared mission and ministry for the sake of the gospel. Highlight ways we can better work together and give us patience to work through disagreement. Lord in your mercy. Yeah. Consoling God. Abide with all who grieve for a loved one who has died. Comfort us with the promise of resurrection and new life with you. Lord, in your mercy. Accept these prayers, gracious God, and those known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We offer our gifts and ourselves to God. Let us pray. Generous God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share for all we need. Through Jesus Christ, who sets us table for all. Amen. All are invited and welcome at the table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should in all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, our Lord, our Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. God of our ancestors, friend and enemies, your children become, come before you. Here is food. Here is drink. These things are yours before they are ours. Now we are making a feast, but it is thanksgiving. God, we are thanking you with our ancestors in faith and all hosts of heaven, God, we thank and rejoice. This food, we shall eat it in your honor. This drink, we shall drink it in your honor. The night of his suffering, we give thanks to the bread that he held in his hands. This bread he shared among his followers, saying, all of you take this, eat this. It is my body. Hand it over for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me share a drink with them. All of you take this drink. This. this is my body, the blood of the new covenant that begins now and lasts forever. This blood is poured out for you and for all people, so that sins may be taken away. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood, blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Together we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your spirit in this gathering, within this meal, among your people. Throughout the world, blessings, praise, and thanks be to you, holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your spirit in your church, without end. Amen. Amen. Together we pray as our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we do not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Wafer. Yeah. 
Now this is the body of Christ. It's given to me. This is the blood of Christ that has been shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in Jesus Christ. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is, If You But Trust in God to Guide You. 769. <laughs> Thanks be to God.